this vis cast is a static equilibrium problem, which implies that the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques are always zero. What we're going to consider here is a boom on the crane. And we've got a diagram below. Uh, we're told some information that it's free to pivot about point P at the bottom of the boom and it's supported by a cable which is attached halfway along the boom. In fact, that cable supplies a tension and that tension is the thing that we want to find. So that tension force um, is pulling on the boom. We're told that the boom has a mass of 1700 kilograms and that this mass is distributed uniformly along the length. That implies some, the center of mass of that object is halfway along the boom. And we can think of the weight force of the boom acting through the center of mass of the boom. We're also told that there's an additional mass which is hanging from the other end of the boom here. So there's a weight force acting down at this end. We'll call that big MG. Um, and we're told that the uh, mass of that uh, ball is 2,200 kilograms. We're given some information about the angle that the boom makes with the horizontal. That angle is 50 degrees. And we should be able to find the uh, tension in the cable from all this information. So let's just start off by interpreting this once again. Static equilibrium, which means that the sum of the forces about the x direction are equal to zero, the sum of the forces about the y direction are equal to zero, and the sum of the torques about any point we choose are equal to zero. Importantly, with a static equilibrium problem, it's always relevant to identify the object that we're looking at, which is the boom here, which I'm trying to draw as a diagram, and all the forces which are acting on the boom and where they are acting at. That's really important too. Now, if you have a look at this, hopefully you can identify that there are two missing forces. Okay, now and the reason why I say there are two missing forces is by considering the sum of the forces in the x direction and the sum of the forces in the y direction. They have to be zero here. So if we take x going horizontally and y going upwards, hopefully you can see straight away that the sum of the forces in the x direction can't be zero because the only horizontal force is a tension force, which means there must be another force which is acting across to the right, which has the magnitude of the tension force. Similarly, if we look at the forces in the y direction, we've only got the weight forces acting downwards. There must be another force which is acting upwards, which has the same magnitude um, as uh, little m uh, plus uh, big M times G. And that's going to be this sort of normal force we might call this. Um, and these are the two forces which are acting at the pivot point. Okay, they're supplied by the pivot point. Now, we don't really know what those forces are, even though we can see what their magnitude is here. Um, uh, you know, this has the same magnitude as a tension force, but it's not, not a tension force per se. Um, but uh, if we want to find the tension force, well, you might think that we can just look at the sum of the forces in the y direction, but all we're going to get here is that T is equal to T. So that doesn't help at all. What does help is to use the sum of the torques about the pivot point. Okay, so let's look at the sum of the torques about the pivot point and they'll have to be zero. Now there are three forces which can cause torques here. Okay, so I might label them torque one plus torque two plus torque three. And those three torques come from three different forces. Uh, one of those torques, T1 here, we can have from the weight of the boom. The weight force of the boom provides a torque uh, about this pivot point P. And uh, we should probably remind ourselves before we jump into this actually, what is torque? What's the definition of torque? Well, it's this uh, R cross F, or if you like, by um, the definition of vectors, it's the magnitude of R times the magnitude of the force uh, times the sine of the angle between them acting in a direction which is perpendicular to both of those vectors. So in this case, both those vectors lie in the plane. The, the direction of the torque is going to be either in or out of the plane, depending upon use of your right-hand rule. And sometimes it's nice to think about that as actually the perpendicular uh, uh, times the force. And so I'll, I might talk about this um, uh, definition down the bottom here uh, in analyzing this situation. Okay, so this weight force, the weight of the boom, it's trying to turn um, that, uh, that boom in a clockwise direction. And typically, because we've got um, uh, a, 
the possibility of a, of a torque into and out of the plane, or, uh, then we want to define one of these as being positive. So let's take the clockwise direction as being positive. So then tau 1 is going to have a magnitude of the weight force, okay, which is little m times g. So that's this part here, the force. And then what I really want to do is find the perpendicular distance. And the easiest way of doing that here is actually if I just drop this force down and draw it like this, you can see it makes a perpendicular here um, with the horizontal. So in fact what we want to find is this length here. And so if I know the uh, length of my boom, well, let's call the length of the boom L. So this distance here is L over 2 uh, to the point where the weight force is acting. Then I can say, because that's the hypotenuse, that uh, that uh, perpendicular component here uh, is L over 2 uh, times uh, the cosine of that angle theta. Now I'm going to write everything down symbolically because it allows me to rearrange things and put the numbers in later on. So theta is this angle 50 degrees, but one, rather than solving it for one angle, I'm going to solve it for all angles. That's much more powerful. Okay, now for tau 2. Tau 2 is the torque produced by the weight of this um, hanging mass. Now, uh, once again, we can say that the weight force here, it's, it's positive because it's trying to turn it clockwise. We've defined clockwise as being um, uh, the into the page direction for torque, and that's going to be positive. So it's a positive quantity. Uh, the weight force is mg. What about this perpendicular distance? Once again, if we drop this down, it's uh, now the perpendicular distance is this part here this length here. And so that's now going to be well, the hypotenuse is L rather than L over 2 because that's the total distance here, L, which is equal to 18, um, times once again, because uh, it's the adjacent side, uh, the cosine of that angle theta. And then finally we've got the torque which is going, being produced uh, by this uh, tension force. So it's trying to turn the object in the opposite direction. You turn it anti-clockwise, we'll call that the negative direction, so it's now going to be a minus. Um, and the amount here is going to be, um, once again, the, the, the force is the magnitude of the, the tension, T. And the perpendicular component, well, once again, um, if we look at that, uh, we've already got the force kind of uh, moving across here and perpendicular to the, to the vertical direction here. So we really just want this length. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, length here, uh, the hypotenuse is L over 2, the opposite side is going to be sine. So it's minus T times L over 2 times sine of theta. And I hope that hasn't dropped off the page and that should all equal zero. So we've got an expression uh, where we know the masses, m, little m and big M, we know g, uh, we know what the length is, okay, L is 18 meters, we know what the angle is, theta, uh, and we want to find t. So in fact this expression will tell us t. So everything else from now on is just algebra, we've already solved the problem. So this is really the evaluation stage. So we've gone through, this is really the development stage, and now we're going to evaluate this. So I need to rearrange this to get t by itself. So what I might do is take this uh, negative term and bring it across to the right hand side. So I've got t uh, times L over 2 times sine of theta is equal to, I've got a few common terms here, so I might just write this as, um, if I take uh, little m over 2 uh, plus uh, big M, and then you can see that we've got common terms here, so G is common, L is common, and cosine theta is common. Okay, so I'll factorise those out. Right, uh, we want to find t, so once again, let's uh, just, uh, well, we can cancel the l's from either side, because um, they, they appear on both sides of the equality, so it's independent of the length here. And uh, what we need to do is then divide by sine theta, and we need to multiply by 2 to get rid of the half, which is on the left-hand side. So t becomes equal to multiplying by 2, and I might take that 2 into the bracket, so I end up with m plus 2 times big M, uh, multiplied by g, and then if I divide by sine theta, well cosine theta over sine theta is actually 1 over tan theta, so I can write this as tan theta on the bottom, so a little bit of trigonometry there, but hopefully you can follow that. Alrighty, so we've got an algebraic expression for the tension, uh, we can numerically find out what's going on here by putting the numbers in, so the small mass was the mass of the boom, 1700 kilograms. The big mass was the mass of, of, the, of the ball at the end, so it's 2200, but it's multiplied by 2, so 4400. Multiplied by 9.8, divide by 10 of 50. And if we pop those numbers in, we end up with, I'm going to need a little bit of working room here, 
uh, we end up with the tension is equal to uh, 50,161 newtons, or let's call that 50 kilonewtons. Okay, so now what I want to do is just assess, is this a reasonable number? Okay, um, so certainly as far as magnitude is concerned, we can think about, um, well, what's the total mass here? So we've got 22,000 kilograms and 1,700 kilograms. So certainly applied by jigs is going to give us a, a number which is in the orders of tens of thousands of newtons. So certainly we've got the right sort of order of magnitude. Um, but what's much more powerful is to actually use this expression here. Okay, what I want to do is try and think about how is this going to behave if I do, if I change something about the system. In fact, and the, probably the nicest thing to look at here is what happens when we change the angle. Okay, so this is really my assessing part here. And what I want to do is think about if I change theta. First of all, let's make theta equal to an angle which is close to 90 degrees. Okay, so what's that mean? It means that the boom is all the way almost vertical. Okay, so the sort of the, the, well, the weight force is hanging down. Um, it's almost vertical and hopefully you can see from that that kind of would imply that the tension force must get smaller and smaller and smaller because the perpendicular component here um, uh, is going to get smaller and smaller. So I would expect that when theta is equal to 90 degrees the tension should be zero and when theta is very close to 90 degrees tension should be getting smaller. So as theta approaches 90 that tension should be approaching zero. Is that described by this equation here? Well the way we do that is remembering that tan theta really is just the slope. Okay, that's what tan theta tells us. So as my slope gets steeper and steeper and steeper as I approach 90 degrees, essentially my, my slope's going to go to infinity. Uh, so if I divide by infinity, then I go to zero. So that certainly describes what's going on. Um, if um, I let uh, my um, theta approach zero, something interesting happens as well. My boom's almost horizontal now. And so, in fact, I've got this uh, very, very large uh, perpendicular distance here. So these weight forces are causing an enormous amount of torque. And how can I counteract that torque uh, by just applying a, um, a horizontal tension force? Well, I don't think I can. I think my tension force would have to become infinitely large. And so once again, if theta goes to zero, my slope goes to zero because I'm horizontal and so the numerator divided by zero becomes infinite. So certainly that means that uh, that behavior is, is, is appropriate as well. So I think we've really understood what's going on here with the static equilibrium. Just to recap, some of the forces, is, uh, some of the torques are zero. Make sure you label all the forces um, and be able to evaluate all those torques in the right uh, place um, and uh, work it out symbolically and always assess what you've got at the end. Okay, good luck.